Welcome to the McGrady Group, where you'll find the best questions, the best answers. I'm Ian McGrady, your host. Joining me today are uh, Scott Licamelli, Vice President at, of Business Development at SunFund, a solar utility company and blockchain development company. Jeffrey Bolden, partner at Blue Lotus Systems Integration and Data Conversion, which is a big data and legacy systems integration firm. And uh, possibly later in the show, Frederick Baker, uh, who is a uh, professional in finance with more than 20 years experience and a th political theorist. So let's get started. Today, we're... Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, there, there you are. Okay. Um, yeah, after, after a long morning uh, of chasing audio all over the internet and our computers, we finally were able to meet. And here we go. Uh, today, we're talking about blockchain, which is one of the biggest stories of the last few months, especially since the price of one particular blockchain product called Bitcoin has skyrocketed in price. And we'll do a brief survey of what blockchain and what cryptocurrencies are. And we'll try to look at how governments are responding, and then we'll open up to the panel with their other um, the other questions. Um, but let's take a look at some of the applications of blockchain technology prices, which is really what's driving the story. These are brands of blockchain applications called cryptocurrencies, which are basically things that people treat like digital money. And here's a tour of just how much one of these so-called so-called coins or token are on the market and then we'll explain what that is now i just checked these prices about a, an hour ago and already uh <laughs> the prices have changed significantly um but bitcoin was trading around nineteen thousand five hundred for one another one called ripple xrp uh, which is one of the major players uh, is at 71 cents Litecoin is at $313.69. Ethereum, which is a, another kind of blockchain technology, it's kind of like Bitcoin, but you can embed contracts in it and it can sort of execute contracts uh, automatically. Uh, that's uh, at $701.61 for one Ether. Uh, Bitcoin ch Bitcoin Cash is at one thousand eight hundred thirty two dollars and forty two cents for one, and that's the relative new new uh, Bitcoin on the block. Um, so right now there are some estimates. Some estimates say there's about thirteen hundred cryptocurrencies, and if you scroll down a list at CoinMarketCap dot com and just start zooming down past them all quickly you'll see a lot of their numbers are coded in green and that means that uh, it seems that the majority of these cryptocurrencies numbers float up it's, it's sort of like it it looks to me uh, i don't know exactly how it works but it seems that as bitcoin rises all boats float and I guess that some of these can be exchanged for regular currency uh, at exchanges, uh, and those exchanges will take uh, some money out uh, in the middle of that transaction. If you want to see the growth, the overall growth from an article in Forbes magazine, uh, it says Bitcoin has become the public's most visible and popular cryptocurrency and also among the oldest of the cryptocurrencies, having first emerged in 2009. Over one year, the market capitalization for Bitcoin has increased enormously from around $7.16 billion in May 2016 to $27.9 billion today. But governments have been weighing in lately, and South Korea, the home, I think, to three of the largest exchanges in the world, uh, is now considering measures from... Uh, issuing a capital gains tax uh, on cryptocurrency trades to actually banning financial firms from owning them. Um, from having spoken with people at the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, there are people who are highly concerned with preserving the wealth of the country. And Bitcoin uh, sure looks like an easy way for things to just sort of fly right out of your hands. Uh, but you guys can correct me on that. Um, there, and from that same article in Forbes... Uh, it says in other now when we're turning um, domestically, it says that the IRS is treating the income or gains from the sale of a virtual virtual currency such as Bitcoin as a capital asset, which is subject to either short term uh, or long term capital gains tax rates, even if that asset is held by more than twelve months. And so, what they're saying is that that by treating Bitcoins and other virtual currencies as property and not currency. The IRS is imposing extensive record-keeping rules and significant taxes on its use. And that means that Bitcoin is basically viewed by the IRS as um, a technology that 
uh, is is it's it's less like a novel thing. It's more like a house, and then and the IRS doesn't care how, how you made your money. It's just that you made some money, and they get to tax it. Um, but uh, on the other on the other hand, uh, if you put cryptocurrency into a Roth IRA, uh, you may be able to realize those gains uh, tax free. Or if in a different retirement vehicle, you may be able to uh, defer those taxes. Um, if the Ian, I, I would drop the whole thing about Roth IRA. Uh, that's that, that's that's the standard with all investments. Well, I don't think people know. I mean, people generally view this thing as like invisible money that doesn't count anywhere. And oh, well, why don't we just focus on the fact that you can you can convert fiat currency by you know over on one of these platforms you know into a variety of cryptocurrencies. So you can essentially dematerialize your fiat currency store of value into whatever respective currency, whether it be Ether or Bitcoin or Litecoin. Okay. Or, or more importantly, that, that it's legal to put, that it's legal to put cryptocurrencies in a Roth. Yeah, okay. Just, that, in other words, that's the, that's the big thing. It's not so much that it, it's tax advantage. That's just, that's everything's tax advantaged. Well, okay, okay. You know, I'm gonna keep that whole exchange in there too, because I think those are both useful points of view. Uh, but I'll keep the tax thing in there. Sorry, also. my tone. My tone was very much editing. So oh. okay, I, mean, <laughs> sure. I, I, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have just cut you off like that if I thought it was live. So well, sorry. No, that's okay. You know, I'm gonna. I'm gonna leave it in. Uh, I think it's a fair exchange. Uh, so basically, uh, Bitcoin is a blockchain type of di di digital currency in which encryption techniques are used to regulate the generation of units of currency and verify the transfer of funds, and they operate independently of a bank. And what what that means is it's numbers tied to an account. And the number of Bitcoins that you own depend on how much you buy in an exchange or how many that you mind. Now, mind you, there is no actual, there's no coin here. Uh, it's That's a word that they've assigned to um, a math problem that you have solved, a puzzle that you've solved. Think in it, The way I think of it, I think of it like an unlocked achievement in a video game. You do a bunch of stuff in a virtual world um, that is math-based, and then you get a virtual reward. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, the, you do a lot of math, and math it gets progressively harder as you go down the blockchain, by the way. And eventually, if your computers are fast enough and you can expend enough money on electricity to do the work, uh, you get an award of a coin or a crypto code crypto uh, currency token uh, in the case of a, an Ethereum based smart contract type blockchain application. Um, <coughs> <coughs> these things are tradable without banks, as we said earlier, and you can buy some stuff with it directly. Uh, and more and more, you can buy more things. You can even pay your kids college tuition at some colleges in Bitcoins now. Um, and they go by a bunch of different names, 1,300 different names, as a matter of fact. Um, but the, ba the basic premise is that these, these are applications, these are programs that run uh, sort of all the time. And you should be able to run, uh, you should be able to, to deal with your Bitcoins and your Ethereum uh, almost any time. And um, you should be able to avoid, avoid things like... Um, uh, being traced, uh, unless you want to be traced, uh, you, you should be able to avoid uh, dealing with intermediary financial institutions, uh, I guess with the exceptions of the uh, exchanges at some point, if you want to turn them into money. And um, they also uh, say that they're useful for avoiding fraud. Uh, but we've, we've already had, I think on the record, there's more than $15 billion of Bitcoin hacks so far. Uh, a recent, um, a recent other hack is a is a white hack, a white hat hack of uh, an Ethereum <laughs> wallet, an, an Ethereum company in Slovenia. Uh, some people took hold of like thirty two million dollars of their Ethereum, and they're like, "We're going to hold this for you until you guys figures out figure out how to manage this responsibly." Okay, so um, basically, the way Bitcoin works is like. Um, this is from an article in IEEE Spectrum. Uh, it says the process of mining Bitcoins works like a lottery. Miners are competing to pr produce hashes, which are alphanumeric strings of a fixed length that are calculated from a data 
of an arbitrary length. They're producing these hashes from a combination of three pieces of data, new blocks of Bitcoin transactions, the last block on the blockchain, and a random number. And these are collectively referred to as the block header for the current block. And each time miners perform this hash function on the block header with a new random number, they get a new result. Now, to win this lottery, a liner must find... And this is the puzzle part. This is the, the hard work part. Must find a hash that begins with a certain number of zeros. And just how many zeros are required is a shifting parameter determined by how much computer cap power is attached to the Bitcoin network. Every two weeks, on average, the mining software automatically readjusts the number of leading zeros needed. And that's the difficulty level by looking at how fast new blocks of Bitcoin transactions are added. Now there's an algorithm that's aiming for latency of 10 minutes in between the blocks. So when the miners boost the computing power on the network, they temporarily increase the rate of block creation. The network senses the change and then it makes it more difficult to continue working. So when a miner's computer finds a winning hash, it broadcasts the block header to the next peers in the Bitcoin network, they win a token, and then they check it and it propagates the whole system further. Now, none of this stuff is perfect. Uh, both of these types of blockchains, either Bitcoin-based or Ethereum-based, uh, have you know issues that come up in the news all the time. Uh, it's still sort of all a, a work in progress. There are, there, are, there are new words entering the vocabulary around this stuff. There's... Um, there's coin, uh, which I'm going to have to bleep out. There's uh, uh, other types of coin that people just go, you know, uh, scam coins where people, the, the coins don't even exist. They just say, hey, I'm, you know, I can invest you in a Bitcoin. And worldwide, uh, people are doing this. They're telling people they can onboard them to get them this inside deal, and then they lose their life savings. And in the case of South Korea, uh, at, the, at an astonishing rate, people are killing themselves over losing their life savings. Um, the so the bit the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so South Korea's response on the governmental level is to look at this very seriously uh, because their people are being very affected. Um, there are remedies that you can do for security. Um, there are some there are hardware solutions that um, you sort of keep this little dongle thing in your pocket and uh, you corroborate some numbers on your account while you're at your computer with this hardware thing, and that's sort of, that's an extra layer of safety, I guess. Um, as for the blockchain environment in the United States, the SEC chair, Jay Clayton, said on December 11th, uh, just a week ago, uh, quote, the technology on which cryptocurrencies and ICOs are based may prove to be disruptive, transformative, and efficiency enhancing. I am confident that developments in fintech will help facilitate capital formation and provide promising investment opportunities for institutional and Main Street inv investors alike. So that means accredited investors who, you know, have more money than the average person and can absorb average, you know, above average risk. Um, and also regular people now can invest in uh, what the SEC, I think earlier this year, designated as um, regulation crowdfunding. This is not the crowdfunding that you're used to at Indiegogo and Kickstarter, where you sort of you know put some money towards a company earlier and they send you an earlier version of a product with a thank you letter, with a video, with this you know a, a little bundle of things. This is where you actually get um, uh, equity in the company, and as the company grows, you grow along. Your money grows along with it, and they work with the money that. You gave them as as opposed to a regular crowdfunding where they they basically sell you stuff and and keep the profit and you don't participate in that aspect. Um, there are at last count thirty five regulation platforms uh, for for um, uh, regulation crowdfunding investment. Um, now. <coughs> um, as far as the Fed uh, in the United States goes, uh, Janet Yellen said, basically, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not a stable store of value. The Fed can't regulate it, and the U.S. doesn't have any plan to digitize the dollar anytime soon. So you could expect that from the Fed, which is in charge of uh, m making all the money in the United States, basically. But as for the, um, the other environment, which is the, the actual environment that we all live in, the, you know, the Earth environment, uh, this is something that Scott could speak to as well. Uh, Newsweek said last week that if you take the total energy output of the world today, 
that blockchain mining of three years from now is going to match the entire world energy output. Um, so three years from now, there's going to, over the next three years, Bitcoin mining of the world is going to be competing with the, well, just called the, like the rest of the world uh, for the energy. And that means that a lot of things um, are going to be, uh, a lot of energy is going to be competed for, uh, especially not just for Bitcoin mining. Uh, you also have uh, GM making a statement recently saying that they want their entire uh, line of cars to be completely electric. You ha I, I have one, two, three wireless devices on me at any given point. Uh, they all demand electricity from the grid. Um, so, uh, there. If you look at the number of country of, if you look at that output uh, of Bitcoin mining right now, there are I think two, 195 countries in the world, and the total Bitcoin mining effort in the world at the present matches the total output of 153 of 195 countries combined. Uh, now that's most of the big countries are left out of that map, but it's most of Africa, uh, a couple in Europe, Iceland, Greenland, uh, and a couple in Asia and a handful of South America that can. Yeah. The estimates are, the estimates are about 29 terawatts of electricity are currently being used per annum versus like 25 terawatts of total demand in Ireland per, per year. Yeah. As a, as, as another way to look at it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, you've got all these blockchain talk technologies going online. You've got various types of blockchain. You've got all these different companies going online. And over time, these things actually get harder and harder to mine. And so, so you have a huge base of things that are going to start demanding it. And then all of the blockchains over time are going to start demanding even more energy to get achieve the same results. So we're, uh, it seems pretty clear to me that we're lining ourselves up for a a very serious uh, competition for energy um, that has already started. Looking at looking at digital currencies as a store of value, I think needs to be looked at within the context of of financial disintermediation as a, a technology and, and finance trend that we've been witnessing and that we'll continue to witness. And by that, I simply mean when you look at traditional payment systems, you know, whether it be traditional banking with a commercial bank or savings institution um, in, in order to move money between counterparties at, at, on a very small scale is, has traditionally been very costly. To trade, to transact has been costly because of margin taking intermediaries such as banks, um, you know, kind of grabbing their, 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 their piece of the transaction pie. So I think that when you look at, at uh, the financial disintermediation um, trend, that blockchain is 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 critical and and you know a critical component of that and, and will be a driver of that. I think there are sort of three three aspects of blockchain technology. Essentially, it's a distributed ledger system that that allows uh, multiple uh, data multiple computers spread you know theoretically and potentially across the world to build using blockchain technology allow transactions to occur. At, uh, at a much lower transaction cost. So, so that's, that's kind of, like, it's basically, it's, it's a highly disruptive technology, for example, in the financial sector. And frankly, for any traditional hub and spoke uh, internet-based company, ranging from Uber to, you know, you name it, um, all of these types of models are, could potentially, in my view, will certainly be disrupted. Uh, and so I think it's, the, the concept is, is that using blockchain technology makes these transactions immutable, makes them transparent and allows uh, a record to occur and allows a low cost other than the electricity cost, as Ian alluded to, uh, a very low, co lower cost uh, option for transacting in whatever it is we're doing. So I think I think that's a huge trend. I also think that that. The globalization. Yeah, actually, you mind if I jump in on jump in on that Absolutely. one? Oh, I have but, a counterpoint. Before you do that, I, ju I just want to mention. I just want to unpack the term. Fintech means financial technology. Disintermediation means you no know, the elimination of uh, people that are involved between the buyer and the seller, like a bank that facilitate the transaction and and take a piece of it. Okay, go ahead. All right, so let me let me hit on that when we talk about um, what what Scott was hitting on. I agree with him completely on the idea that this could result in lower costs. But I want to disagree on the idea that uh, distributed that distributing these things is a good long term solution. Um, 
blockchain technology proponents often talk about um, blockchain as a distributed database and make it sound like that's a positive thing. Um, in general, uh, that's considered in computers generally to be a very negative thing. And the reason for that is there are certain fundamental unfixable problems in distributed databases. Um, one is what's called the durability, latency, consistency trade-off. Um, durable transaction means that if I actually commit a transaction, that it doesn't get rolled back. In other words, the database doesn't say, you know, you thought you did it. Yes, you did it. And then 30, you know, 30 minutes later decide, now nah, you didn't really do that. Um, but, the, which would the, be, but, the, but this is an accomplishment that the Trump administration achieved very well. They had a server in a hospital. They had a server in Trump Towers. They had a server in Moscow and they were coordinating information. They were co uh, that, that's correct. It, durable databases exist all over the place. I mean, I'm sorry, distributed databases exist all over the place. This is not unused. And yes, um, though they actually used, interestingly enough, a high, a high latency system, which is what why we have such good records, because we could see the databases synchronizing with one another slowly over a period of multiple minutes. Uh -huh. um, so so that what actually left the record behind was the fact that they used a very reliable, high durability, but high latency system. In other words, that is to say slow, um, that made sure that the d databases say, stayed synchronized. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that, you're right, that is an example, but that's an example of, you know, when they had some critical data, they didn't use a classic distributed database model. They used a sort of classic unified database model across distributed physical locations. Ah. Um, so yeah, that you're right. That is an example. Um, the second, the, so basically latency, if you're going to assume that, you know, we want our financial transactions to not get canceled out randomly, which is what it would look like to uh, somebody. In other words, that, you know, most of your credit card transactions actually happen, but some of them just disappear. Um, and, um, you know, and we want them to be consistent. Uh, that is to say that everybody agrees whether you did or didn't pay for this thing. Um, then it's going to be, then you're going to have latency that increases as the number of nodes increases, which is probably intolerable for a lot of these things as we have. Hold on, what's um, a node? What's a node? I mean, oh, node is if a, I get a, a node, I'm taking has, it out. You know what I mean? Like, a, right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, right. nodes uh, are bad. A, a node is a, a person that is maintaining the ledger. So a copy of the ledger anywhere. So for example, I think there's 64 copies of blockchain. Phone, there's 64 64 no, 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 no. Like if, it, let's say, for example, if everybody had blockchain on their cell phone, every cell phone would be a node. Oh. Everybody that has a copy of part of the ledger. Is that what wallets are? So on? that's every, uh, yeah, every, it, it, well, no, it's worse than a wallet. A wallet is sort of a, a unsynchronized version of the database. So your wallet would be on your computer, on your cell phone, on your wife's computer, on the computer you have in your vacation house. Um, all of those are nodes. Um, and as the number of nodes increases, latency increases linearly. If you choose not to increase latency linearly, then you start getting what's called eventual consistency, which is to say that nodes eventually catch up with each other and develop a consistent version of the database, but they may not be reconcilable. It, eventually consistent systems end up having sequences of transactions that are impossible. Uh, so for example, I gave Scott $50 on Thursday. He spent the $50 on Wednesday. Well, uh, how the hell did he how, spend the money before I yeah, got how, it? How do these transactions uh, drift right, apart? That is, well, basically because the two things aren't communicating with one another. So let's say for example, um, Scott is getting order and information in different order. We're used to unified databases where there's a single source of truth and there's a single source of when things happened. Um, when you break that apart, when you distribute it, you no longer have a single source of truth. And so the problem is, is that things can happen out of order for various recipients. It's very much like uh, relativity, you know, the whole thing with relativity and physics um, that people agree on. Uh, you know, within uh, the people don't agree on when things happen in space because they're too far apart. The same thing can happen on a computer network. They don't agree on the ordering of events. And so when they make try and make things eventually consistent, what you get are impossible orders of events that have to be agreed to. Hmm. Um, or, like I said, or you can have non durability where if you get a contradiction, you just throw out one of the transactions, or you can have uh, high late, incredibly high latencies 
which is going to be impossible if you're talking about hundreds of millions of things. I mean, you know, like I said, it increases linearly as the number of nodes increases. So latency could be years, uh, which is unacceptable. So, you know, when we talk about distributed database technology, distributed database technology is a bad thing um, for consistency and durability. Um, it, you only use it because, you know, because you either need more computing power than you can, than you can possibly have. You're okay with inconsistency, which is not the case in, um, financial systems. You know, when you contrast that to a unified database like eBay, Wikipedia, bank, you know, or putting credit card transactions, you know, with your checking account, Bank of America, Visa, the NX system, um, that are unified, that, you know, maybe they're distributed physically, but they're unified in the sense that all the nodes are constantly checking in with one another and are designed to be reliable. And if somebody's not got an inconsistent connection, they fall off and then they don't come back on and start serving data until they've gotten consistent with everybody else. This more sort of classical, what's called consistent available system, mm -hmm. um, where every piece of the system is either fully up or fully down mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and everything is consistent. There's a way to linearly order events. Um, you know, these other systems are, there's no question better in, uh, for the purposes of financial transactions, legal contracts, et cetera. The reason that this distributed system is, is being adopted is, you know, as Scott mentioned, because of the lower cost aspects. But there's no reason you couldn't offer the lower cost aspects from Bank of America, from eBay, from Visa. No, words, I think I mean, that's that's exactly what we're seeing. Like, for example, if you look at Chase Bank, they just um, rolled out relatively recently a new um, online payment system. So they're they're essentially, you know, kind of trying to keep in step with this disintermediation process by offering lowering lower cost money transfer solutions to to their existing customer base. For example, to your point, and I think I think hedge, I, I, I think hedge funds exactly. have, I think have they used. Win. I think hedge funds have used. Uh, blockchain in uh, VC for, uh, I think, more than a couple hundred million dollars at this point, at least, uh, according to one sort of older report that I read. I don't know what they're up to now, but I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. Fred, but that's not to say that's not to say that there that there won't be bespoke permissioned blockchain um, technologies that that will indeed reduce you know transaction costs and will be manageable within limited ecosystems uh, you mm -hmm. know and and, let, and we could talk about a use case maybe a little bit later um, you know in the energy sector but just mm -hmm. wanted to chime in there absolutely if you yeah. limit the if you limit the, then you're limiting the number of nodes you limit the number of nodes you don't run into linear problem you can have durability and consistency uh, while still maintaining reasonable latencies absolutely exactly if you, yeah. node, if you can limit the nodes you you solve the math problem. So when you say when you talk about limiting nodes, uh, what kind of numbers are we talking here? Like more than like more or like what kind of numbers of nodes are you? What does that mean? Well, I mean you start seeing degradation at two, going from one to two already. You, the degrade you fall off a cliff in terms of performance. When you go to uh, twelve or fourteen, there's another big drop off in performance. When you go to um, you know, you start seeing a, a, a sort of moderate drop off because, you know, we have good technology up to about 10,000. Um, then you see a pretty sharp drop off after about 10,000, you know, and again, this is going to be specific, you know, to years and we're talking decades in the future. So it's hard for me to give exact, but, it, you know, you see a ne next big drop off at around 10 million. Um, but when we start talking about everybody in the world having a digital thing and all of the, you know, the Internet of Things, you know, we're the way people are talking, they're talking as if, we're up around 50 billion. Well, you've had about nine or 10 major drop-offs in speed. You are talking about weeks, uh, potentially, with today's technology to reconcile that. And even if it gets 100 times faster, you're still talking about hours. Well, I think I think very recently, uh, when the Bitcoin price was going up quite a bit, uh, people were having issues trying to transact with their exchanges. They're like, it's been, you know, it's been two weeks. Uh, I can't get my 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 coins traded in, traded out. Um, that probably has more to do with the the volume of transactions. Uh, uh, go, that probably has more to do with the volume of transactions in and out of those sites versus uh, the okay. underlying. Okay. Because they're acting as custodians of the cryptocurrency mm -hmm. that I assume they have, you know, on their books. 
And so it's probably more of an issue of their site being overwhelmed. Uh, so they're just underpowered sure. and overwhelmed, but it's not it's not the same blockchain problem that we were just discussing. Okay. No, no, it is the same blockchain problem we're discussing. It's a perfectly good example of it. Uh, that, is, that is exactly the kinds of things you're starting to get. If, if large numbers of nodes in the system can't keep up, then latency increases linearly. In other words, as the number of transactions increases, the time of the transaction increases linearly. If I was doing a million transactions and it took only... Uh, 10 seconds and I go to a billion, well, now that's suddenly a thousand seconds. Um, you know, if I go to a hundred billion, that's a hundred thousand seconds and we're talking, you know, days, et cetera. Mm. So no, that's exactly the problem we're talking about. Oh, okay. Of course, we're also assuming that there would be no technological improvements over the next decade while all these blockchain technology applications are being developed. No, no, we're to, I don't think we're assuming that at all. I think we're just provide. saying that's the, that's the state of the, that's the state of... No, 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 but I'm saying, but... Yeah. but one thing you have to remember is that is that most of these technologies will take years to develop. So I think the assumption in the market is that most likely technology will develop along with it to address at least partially address some of the issues that, that Jeff is, is bringing up. I, I would agree. And if you don't mind, I'll jump in with why I think that's wrong. Is um, that good? Sure. Yeah, um, and for starters, okay. Jeff, does Moore's law still apply anymore? Moore's law being like the the computational power doubles no, we, we, every two uh, years uh, at the same price. Extent, no, at at, at a roughly you know roughly in two, in the year two thousand, um, we started to hit uh, the problem with that we don't know how to make circuits as thin as we need to. Um, basically, you know we're starting to run into certain physics limits um, about the positioning of an electron as we made circuits thinner and thinner. So let me just describe what Moore's law says. Moore's law basically says that, you, that the number of transistors you can get in a fixed unit of space doubles every 18 months. And that held true for several decades. It was absolutely wonderful and it led to massive increases in computing power throughout the world from the 60s straight through all through the 90s. What happened, and, you're, and it's a good, great point. Um, what's happened now, at, starting at around 2000, is we started to reach, you know, electrons are probabilistic entities. In other words, they don't live at a particular spot. They probabilistically live within a distribution of various spots. And if the wire's big enough, that's not a problem because it's, you know, for, purpo for purposes, you can treat it as if it were in a particular spot. As the wires get thinner and thinner, um, the probabilistic stuff begins to become a problem because they can jump from one wire to another. In other words, the data can change. Um, the thinner you make the wire, the more likely those changes are to occur. The more data corruption you have, the more circuits you have to have to disambiguate um, invalid data. Um, in other words, correct the fact that the electrons have jumped. The more complicated that gets, the harder it is to get things through uh, the system because they're disambiguating more and more quickly. And we are running into that problem all the time, which is not to say that we're not making circuits smaller, but we're making circuits smaller at a remarkably slow and ever decreasing rate. Um, we currently do not have a solution to that problem. Um, computers have stopped getting better as fast as they were for, you know, during the 90s for the last, you know, starting, you know, most people experience this starting around 2005, 2006, where their laptop is better than their previous laptop, but not better the way it used to be. You know, when, you know, 1995, you got a laptop, 1999, you got a laptop, it was just orders of magnitude, you know, it was like an order of magnitude fast. Yeah, now it's You're just, not, you get, you get like, your, your choices are like a couple gig, a couple tenths of a gigahertz more. And they're trying to sell you like more features, like different size, uh, different, different size computer, different size uh, memory, RAM, but the, they're not really selling you like huge increases in speed anymore unless they're selling you just tons and tons and tons of processors on a chip. Right. And even there, there you have problems because you're, you're, you're chip free. So the answer is, is no. More law, Moore's law is stopping. Um, there's other things that we're doing to improve computers, but in general, um, you know, we, we appear to be in kind of a technological bottleneck where, you know, we're, we're squeezing the lemon harder and harder to try and get speed out. And yes, there's still some lemon juice in there, but uh, it's getting harder and harder to get lemon juice out of that lemon. Um, now, you know, that's not to say that there may not be a breakthrough, which is one of the things I want to talk about. There is there is some stuff in sight, let's say, over the next two centuries um that is that could you know give us those kinds of m unbelievable jumps again you know computers that are a hundred thousand a billion times faster than our current computers um but they're not in they're not in sight for the next five years um 
so let me let me address the issue of the technology problem. The basic way that cryptography works, blockchains are based on cryptography, uh, which is to say that this is data that you can um, pass safely through people you don't trust because they can't read it. Um, and, but the people you do trust can read it because they have the right key. Mathematically, this almost all the cryptography that exists today, and let's say all the cryptography that is used currently in, in blockchain, is dependent upon the fact that we don't know how to solve a math problem called the discrete log problem. And oversimplifying that math problem a little bit, what it means is that we right now know how to multiply numbers and do exponents on a computer much, much faster than we know how to factor numbers. And, and to factor a number means to break the number down rather than build numbers up. Right, so, exactly. So, so in speak. other words, 15 equals 3 times 5. In other words, figuring that out, that 15 is equal to 3 five, times 5. Like the, if you think back to like fourth grade or fifth grade math where you took numbers and you got its prime factors, mm -hmm. that, is, that is the problem. That we know how to do – prime factorization is really hard right now for a computer while multiplying and taking exponents is really easy. Mm. That's it. That is, that is, that is the big – fact that all of cryptography lives on. Um, now, we've been making a lot of progress mathematically, in other words, better mathematical algorithms to attack this factorization problem. Um, we also have been making progress on it technologically. So for example, um, there's this notion of what's called, uh, but when you talk about technological solutions to this problem, that's it. You know, there's no, there's no good way to- You mean solutions you know, that happen, happen in physical space? or even theoretical mathematical space. In other words, we don't have good algorithms. Um, in other words, so, so, so there's no the theory. Problem. There's no like theory out there. That's better either. Right now there's, well, there, there are, th right. There's, there are theories that are, well, there are theories that are better that we don't know how to implement. We don't know how to build the computers that run them. And so let me, let me jump into that. That's a great question. So there's a type of thing called a quantum computer, which is a computer that um, basically can operate over enormous distances that uses the position of an atom. So it's much thinner circuits. Um, and, and it has three know, positions instead of on or off. Yes, exactly. So you, you, you got it. And, and we don't know how to make reasonably sized quantum computers yet. Um, we can be, make computers that are about seven bits in size. So there's one bit, uh, there's eight bits in a byte. Um, so when somebody talks about a gigabyte, they're talking about a billion bytes or 8 billion bits. We know how to make them quantum computers that are like 10 bits, 20 bits, 30 bits. In other words, these are at the level of the kind of mechanical computers that people made in the 18th century. But the in terms the, of the, the, the material universe that we're standing in is a quantum computer. It's, potentially, yes. In other words, right. right, you could actually use the entire universe as a computer. Um, I mean, again, the amount of energy you would need would be phenomenal. It'd be, uh, you know, some tiny percentage of the Big Bang. And but, Bitcoin you know, will match that Earth. energy output in just 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but, but, the, but if you can get a quantum computer to work um, that's larger, then there's a thing called Shor's algorithm, which allows you to factor in linear time. Um, and, you know, basically, so we know the math. We just don't know how to build a computer that can execute the math. Um, to solve this discrete log problem. Hmm. We ha have been able to build small versions of those computers. Let's assume that it does take something like, you know, sometime over the next 200 years or a half a percent a year till we get a major breakthrough and then the discrete log problem fails. And once the discrete log problem fails, all these Bitcoins, all this cryptographic information is visible to anybody who's reasonably interested. Hmm. So does that mean... Does, does that mean that... Uh, blockchain has like a 200 year ride uh, before something else has to happen or the probably uh, what I'm saying is it could be 200 years or it could be 40 <coughs> and it could happen instantaneously and it hits us all at once now yeah, you know, guys, so uh, just to chime in you know and when you say 40 years and when you look at the 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 coin offering market which is has raised 1.5 billion dollars of cash specifically to develop technologies to you know, in some way commercialize blockchain technology in various sectors of, of the global economy, <laughs> you know, if, if, if what, what uh, Jeff is saying is accurate, then I, I'm not expecting that those companies are going to last given their high burn rates. So I'm wondering the, what the value of these cryptocurrencies 
it may or may not be. I mean, obviously there are a few leaders and we'll see, we might see Bitcoin evolve as a, as a you know, long-term store of value, but the concept that these dozens and dozens of other blockchain, you know, app tech stories will, will go, it, it's very similar to kind of the early internet. Would you agree, Jeff, that you kind of, you have all these concepts, but the ability to execute given the technical limita limitations that you're talking about, you know, may, we, we could be talking decades, not, not five or 10 years. Well, right. I mean, yeah, yeah the, I mean, the problem is decades out from materializing this specific the problem, problem. Well, the problem is probably decades out from materializing. I mean, you know, there have been in human history, brilliant mathematicians who came in, came up with great insights. Hmm. If one smart kid thinks of one really good idea to get a good handle on the discrete log problem, we're done. It's over. Right and, now, and then we're all you know, watching the same Jodie Foster tomorrow. movie where she adopts this kid and he's brilliant, right? And <laughs> and the CIA is after them and they go into a safe house. Okay, I got it. Uh, right. So, I mean, crypto analysis. So, in other words, cryptography is a is a valid field and has had a lot of really great successes. But crypto analysis, breaking codes, is also a valid field. I just want to give a couple examples, by the way, of other places where I think it's going to fail. And I'm going to hand it back to Scott. And I know I'm I'm I'm. Uh, taking the floor too long here, but just sort of addressing the, why I don't think, why I don't think that yeah, technologically we're, we're out of this thing. Um, let me just give you a couple examples. The biggest, um, you know, that the people are familiar with, you guys have all seen, you know, heard about the Enigma machine, which was the German machine that was used in World War II. The what machine? <laughs> that machine was considered completely Wait, the what? The what machine? The Enigma. Uh, oh, Enigma. Yeah, yeah. Right, the Enigma machine, right. There's been movies about it now and it gets talked about. It's a, it was a code machine. So it's a good example of what did what did state of the art the best scientists in the 1940s developing a widespread cryptographic system built, and they built something with 151 million trillion keys. So um, that system was unbreakable as far as they were concerned. These were the best minds. This was not you know no no expense was spared. 151 trillion keys in the 75 years later is not even a challenging code to break. In other words, with today's technology, you don't have to be Alan Turing to um, break the enigma, you could, any, any middle school student on a, on a home computer could do it easily. Um, that's how fast crypto analysis, and if he uses any techniques, then he could probably do it on his, on his watch. Um, DES and RC4, which were codes that came out in the, in the 60s, are gone. They're broken. Um, there's also been other, so, you know, first of all, there's a, there's a long history of crypto analysis breaking codes. Now that one involved both math and brute force. Um, Heartbleed is another good example, which uh, people may have heard about and not really understood. Uh, and it's not worth going into how that worked, but essentially if you have a cryptographic system and you can, can and you, the system has slight errors and it has to encrypt for you. In other words, you can, in other words, it's not just initiating contact, but you can force it to, encrypt for you, then you were able to get it to overshare. In other words, give you other people's information and you're uh, uh, encrypted using your passwords. So mm -hmm. in other words, I could get I could get the system to send me an encrypted version that I can read of somebody else's password. That was the heartbeat bleed virus. So, you know, it was a mistake wow. or um, a bug. You know, it was a mistake, but it, these mistakes happen. Um, in fact, they're very common. Uh, developers make these kinds of mistakes all the time. They're people. And most of them don't understand math and don't understand cryptography. As you start implementing this stuff in multiple applications, the failure rate is pretty high of cryptographic mistakes. Um, MIT is estimated as high as 80%. In other words, 80% of applications that use cryptographic technology make a mistake that results in the cryptographic technology not being executed properly. Um, you know, uh, so let's, by let's, the way, let's, let's try to reel this back in just a little bit to, sure. to the blockchain. Uh, so the point we, that we were making is that um, the blockchain has, as we know it today, it appears that it has a certain kind of shelf life that could be on the order of decades or centuries, but uh, a lone wolf mathematician could come in and just be like, oh, hey, I got it. And bing, then suddenly uh, they publish their paper and some other kid on their computer tries to, tries out their method and then bing, the blockchain cryptographic uh, method is obsolete. Yep. Is it, that's Everything is readable. Okay. Everybody, everybody is readable. I can send <clears throat> back to anybody, anybody else's <clears throat> money on, blo on, on blockchain. I can move. In other words, once I know that Ian's got a blockchain, um, I can go ahead and spend his money. Okay. 
so but that's that's still down the road and th- and that's your main point that that it's that that is an imperfection that is built into the system because of the nature of the math but it, that's not a a clear and present danger yet is that right yeah and i would agree no, I think I mean, it is a clear and brain well, present danger all all technology all disruptive technology will eventually be usurped by other disruptive technology and so on and so on as we've seen through the centuries and frankly your comment about the you know the uh, enigma machine or the or the whatever the device used by these enigma. researchers in the uk during world war ii to break it um is an example, I think, of just how, yeah, you're absolutely right. Of course, you know, in in, in hindsight, all these technologies from 30 or 40 or 50 years ago were eventually usurped by new concepts, new methods. And yes, of course, um, the distributed ledger technology is not a, you know, basically what you're saying is that eventually there will be a new technological development which would essentially invalidate the immutability and security of blockchain technology. Is that basically what you're saying? And so, therefore, it's not worth developing? Or, like, what's your sort of view on that? Yeah, what's it? Oh, well, so my, what, what's my it? position is that yeah. we have to have, whenever we talk about putting a large percentage of the world's finances in this technology, we must have a answer to the question, what do we do if simultaneously all of these systems stop functioning? together all at once with very little notice that's a very unpopular question at the moment and let me tell you why (laughs) 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 because people are rushing in the direction of uh on the, on the one hand, there's the, the financial incentive. On the other hand, there's this te- technological application incentive, which is to really try to make the world a better functioning place for everybody. Yeah, let, why don't we talk about specific, some examples of use cases for blockchain technology, okay. especially within within the context of sort of the universal, global disruptive technologies that that you know Jeff is clearly stating you know what the obstacles of bringing that you know to reality are versus <clears throat> excuse me permissioned or bespoke blockchain technologies that are limited to a specific ecosystem of a user all right um, so let's, but, kind of- let's just let's just uh, put a cap on Jeff's thing so so Jeff this problem is not going away this this problem exists and it's just sort of an unpopular question and nobody's really is that an elephant in the room? Uh, how how concerned should the world be about that question right now? Well, right now, blockchain uh, blockchain is cute. It's a cute little side thing. You know, when you talk about 1.5 billion or 400 million, we have 1.5 billion dollar screw ups all the time. So if it happened tomorrow, who cares? You know, yeah, some people who are invested in blockchain um, might see their currency go to zero, or um, uh, you know, but it, it we're talking about an amount of money that's trivial. If this were to become a major center of the world's commerce, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 percent of the world's commerce, um, and we were to use it for all kinds of, you know, confidential information and distributed databases, sort of what the visionaries are talking about. um, That in that world, a sudden sharp break would be devastating. And then we should be worried. So what I'm saying is, is that I believe that the visionaries who are saying, you know, yeah, we're going to solve some of the problems through technology are at the same time having to understand the crypto analysis world is also developing technology. And, you know, there, there is only one thread holding this together, this discrete log problem. Um, and that thread, while strong, it, you know, there are people taking an ax to it on a, every day. Mm. All right. Thanks for that situational awareness. That's, that's a great contribution, I think, to the dialogue. Okay, Scott. Um, Scott, you you wanted to tell us about um, some things that can be done with blockchain right now, in while while the environment is mathematically safe for uh, deploying blockchain uh, answers to uh, real technological, real financial problems that the world has. There, there, there are sort of two cat two buckets of you know blockchain you know technology applications that I would I would classify. So in other words, irrespective of sector. Um, I think there's there's the global, uh, you know, unlimited use case where you have um, take for example financial markets, a classic fintech or financial uh, technology disintermediation play whereby someone comes in and let's just take for example Uber I think is a very good example because we all understand it so we hub and spoke model 
of an internet business such as Uber, they're dictating price to the driver and then they're dictating the, the price that the, the rider needs to, to pay for a ride in any respective geography. So an example of a highly disruptive blockchain, you know, uh, uh, the technology ap application would be a scenario whereby you use the, you use blockchain technology to create, let's assume something like, uh, you know, Lyft coin or Uber coin or something or whatever uh, alternative in which, in which case drivers and uh, passengers would be connecting without the central hub that is essentially stripping a substantial or the majority of the margin out of that, transactional process. And, and the concept is, is that the technology would allow the, you know, the riders and the drivers to connect based on their preferences and settings, you know, within that ecosystem uh, and thereby pay less and earn more without having to pay a central hub, if you will, um, in that process. So that, that's sort of like conceptually a very broad example of, of how the technology works. So, and, and that, so and that margin, the, margin is the, the difference between how much it costs someone to provide a service and the profit. Is that right? Yeah. In other words, that rather than paying Uber to allow them to generate income, you're essentially saying, hey, we're going to use this blockchain technology. It might charge a small transactional fee to to facilitate and maintain that ecosystem. But ultimately, the driver and the, the driver will earn slightly more and the, the, the passenger will pay slightly less because they're not paying a central manager of that of that uh ecosystem other than other than the blockchain technology company that develops this say ride cryptocurrency in this example uh in which case they would have a very small fee so it's kind of like reducing transaction fees with that technology i mean that that's the that's okay. the that's the development that's going on right now in multiple sectors so that's one side and i think that that and that's and that's kind of on the in. smart contract side uh on the like yes, the absolutely. ethereum side of the blockchain less on the bitcoin side of the blockchain is that right? Yeah, and there are some new. There are also some new versions of that as well from some other developers, uh, particularly like in the in the energy sector. There's some new new technologies other than you know um, Ethereum uh, or smart contract based systems uh, as we would normally understand them. But not to digress. So so that that's part of the global you know disintermediation concept. It, it it also links into the concept of just just the globalization of finance and the globalization of the economy that we've seen in the post World War II era and really beyond. Now, I, I think that the technology that the concept is is that if you can have, create a globally scalable technology that works, you can reduce costs, you can increase, uh, you know. Uh, operational efficiencies and things of that nature. So that's sort of the broader view. When you, when you turn to a specific use case within a limited ecosystem, you know, i.e. meaning a limited number of users or nodes, and as Jeff was you know, referring to it uh, in terms of the, of the demands on the system, you're talking about permissioned blockchain applications or bespoke, if you will. And I'll give you a very good example of, let's take the energy sector. So you have retail buyers of electricity and they're what they're called consumers of electricity so blockchain technology would kind of turn that around a bit um in a in a permission limited bespoke application let let's assume that say a, a major utility such as you know con edison in new york decided that they wanted to create blockchain applications that would allow for the eventual peer-to-peer -peer trading of electricity by consumers who currently only have the option of, let's say, they install a solar array on their on their house and they and they want to reduce their electricity costs. If they overproduce electricity, they're selling back to the grid at wholesale rate. So they're getting a very low you know, return. Peer-to-peer -peer trading within that type of ecosystem would allow Con Edison customers to buy and sell electricity, perhaps obviously on an automated basis, you know, based on pricing, demand, excess production. Um, rather than the only option being just getting, you know, the the wholesale price, for example, and, and just in this very basic basic example I'm giving. So, essentially, f for bespoke applications, you're going to improve op operational efficiencies. Um, it's going to change the way companies interact with their customers, and it's going to allow for new services, specifically such as peer-to-peer -peer electricity trading. And that that is that's very related to the evolution of distributed generation, meaning like you know standalone solar and other renewable energy projects that generate excess production. So <clears throat> that's a very specific use case. We're far away, I think, from from bringing that to reality, given a, a vast uh, array of of regulatory issues. And frankly, 
because a lot of the, the companies that control these ecosystems may or may not want to develop these technologies because it, it essentially, you know, reduces their control to a degree. So, so those are kind of the two, the two applications. I, I think that if you, if you're looking to invest in, in these ICOs or coin offerings, um, that's, you should really be asking the, the, the question is like, what is the use case for the coin or the, the, the cryptocurrency or blockchain technology that's being developed by a company that I'm looking at. Yeah, if you, if you read these white papers, um, well, the, yeah, there's a couple of problems with that. The SEC says uh, if you – now, now I'll, I'll just say that I'm working with Scott uh, at his company. I'm a contractor at SunFund, and um, so I've learned quite a bit over time uh, about this. And I, I can't say I've learned quite a bit, but I've, I've had a lot of exposure to it. And the SEC would say – um, there are very good reasons uh, why people should uh, under, you know, understand what they're doing. Uh, specifically, if there, there, are, there are ways to invest in ICOs that are uh, SEC regulated, which are... Well, yeah, let, let, me, let me chime in here. So yeah. there, there are two classifications that, that a token or a coin would have. So it's either going to be a utility token, in which case it would not technically be classified as a security and therefore would not be subject to regulation by the Securities and Exchange Commission for, for U.S. investors specifically here. Uh, and then there's what, what is, would be classified as a security token, meaning effectively you're selling a token or a future token or what have you. But in reality, that that is a security, at least in the eyes of the SEC, and therefore requires registration. So so this is for our U.S. audience. If you're if you're looking at at these coin offerings as sort of the next step, you know, what do we do after Bitcoin? Bitcoin has gone through the roof. OK, there are all these ICOs, these coin offerings. You know, how do we make sense of this? The first thing you need to look at is, is uh, does the does the ICO have they register? Or is it an SEC registered offering? Because if you're a U.S. investor, you know, buying into that deal and it's not, um, as we've seen with Munchie and a couple of other uh, companies, they've been forced to uh, return money to investors, you know, where you had, you know, unregulated securities being marketed to U.S. based retail investors. Right. So and, that, that's and, a critical thing to look at. And by their nature, these people, the, the, an ICO can say, hey, you know, we're blockchain, we're untraceable, give us your money. And then you give your money, you give them your money. And if they're not, if they're not a CC registered, they're not too into banks either. And then whoop, your money, your money is blockchained out. Um, pretty quickly. So yeah, I, I, I agree. With this. <laughs> there's I mean, no real it, like it, trace. It's un, like by it, its nature, it's not traceable. So the, and, and this is not, and the, so the, in the United States, you have, you've got the SEC and for our listeners in other parts of the world, and I know that we have a handful at this point, we've got more than 600. Now, I think upwards of like the high 500s of downloads. Thanks guys very much. We're doing great. Um, every country, probably has some kind of, you know, regulatory authority on these issues. So if it's not the SEC uh, in, in the United States, you know, look to your country and make sure that the ICO that's being offered is registered with whatever the authorities are in your country. So at least these people have some measure of transparency, if not just outright accountability. Uh, yeah, and just to follow up on that, um, one of the other things I think that you might see coming up um, you know, irrespective of U.S. enforcement, you know, SEC enforcement, if they're concerned that, you know, U.S. investors are gaining access to, you know, ICOs that are that are not, you know, registered with, in the United States. Um, you know, one of the other things to consider is, is when you look at some of the use cases of some of the ICOs that have apparently raised money, you know, in hours, um, it, it kind of raises eyebrows because there, there appears to be the potential for uh, activities such as money laundering by perhaps organized crime groups from Russia uh, or other parts of uh, the former Soviet Union, utilizing these channels similarly to the way they you were using uh, at a much larger scale, like take Deutsche Bank, you know, engaging in fake equity trades to channel billions and billions of dollars out of the country. This is yet another example, another conduit of a way to wash cash or invest, frankly, in cryptocurrency that was due to, you know, such as Bitcoin uh, that was, you know, gained through illegal activity. So I think that's going to be a big, a big uh, concern. And I think that when, when investors look at these potential deals, they really need to, to check the domicile of the individuals who are, who, who are running these operations because they, they seem a bit, some of them I think could be a bit questionable. Yeah. And I think the, 
there's me, a can I, can there's a section of the yeah sure just a second uh, there's a section of securities law that deals with bad actors but uh, if if you're a bad actor in a different country that doesn't prevent you from doing business in the United States so um, you people should really like lean into their paperwork and read whatever is available about any of the people that are involved with it um, so that they know exactly who's involved and where they're from and all that's and and where their interests are and all those things. I was going to just jump in that uh, with the, and agree with the, what Scott was saying um, strongly that you know he's actually presenting exactly what I uh, what counters all, sort of all the things I was talking about with distributed the problems with distributed and cryptography. If you have a legitimate company that is SC offered and you have an ICO, um, then really you know what you're talking about with using blockchain technology is not fundamentally different than when we moved from bonds having physical coupons where you ripped off the physical coupon and took it to a physical bank to what we have today with bonds that pay have virtual coupons that are stored with your brokerage that puts cash in your account on a regular basis um, through virtual money transactions that's a mechan that's just a change in mechanism and in that case you know let's take the worst scenario that suddenly the blockchain doesn't work well okay the company knows who's registered as an owner at the time, you know, before there was a problem, they can simply re-register these things as stock certificates or bonds or whatever they're actually backed in. And they become a normal financial, possibly virtual, but a normal financial asset that integrates back into the regular financial economy. Plus they're backed in something, you know, like for example, SunFund pays a dividend on their ICO. I mean, there's a cash dividend that you get paid. So it's not like, you know, the value of this is based upon the success of the cryptography. The value of this is based on the fact that they give you a check. Well, um, no, you know, I'm sorry, just just to just to clarify. So we're, we're offering two securities. So effectively, you're getting a preferred equity share with our, our crowdfunding offering. And then you're also getting uh, a simple agreement for future tokens. So you're getting so there's two separate offers. Essentially, the token is a bonus on top of a dividend paying preferred equity instrument. Just that's all in fiat currency in U.S. dollars. Just to be clear. Thanks. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I thought the currency. I, I apologize. I I, yeah, I was definitely wrong. I thought the, the coin paid uh, was a preferred equity. OK. And, so, and, uh, and Scott, just just incidentally, your offer was the first hybrid offer like this on an SEC registered platform. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, not to, I don't want to talk about our, our thing too much, but yeah, basically that, and that was something that we did because we were very, very concerned about compliance, you know, with, we, we worked very closely with a number of securities lawyers regarding this issue. And they were, you know, really advising us that you absolutely, if you're U.S. domiciled, you must, uh, you know, register the, uh, this is a security token. So it is the first hybrid prefer equity of some type plus a future token. It's basically equity plus a pre-ICO. All right. So for what it's worth, worth, I know you're, you don't want to talk about too much about your thing, but I think that's a great model. I, I, I think it's terrific. I think it's legally compliant. I think it's contractually enforceable. And I think it's not dependent upon, um, you know, the fact that we can't solve a math problem to have value. Like in, in terms of, right. Thanks. In, in terms yeah, of, I mean, based, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. In terms of scale, uh, when you talk about a bespoke, a bespoke blockchain universe versus like the you know measured against let's say the entire bitcoin universe uh is that like a smaller by a factor of a hundred a thousand a million it's a closed system that you're talking about developing right yeah i mean so this is just like to expand on like use case concepts so basically what the 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 sun fund model is we're a real world company that that develops owns and operates uh, distributed energy, you know, renewable energy resources in the United States. And that generates, you know, return for investors. But we're also developing, you know, blockchain technology. Uh, I think the main, go the initial phase will be, well, there'll be sort of two components. One will be providing bespoke uh, <coughs> systems for utilities in the United States. So it is scalable. I mean, it's an $18 trillion economy. So if you, if you say, okay, we're going to be working with some of the largest utilities in the country, um, to, to bring, um, you know, this, this technology to their users, to their customers, that that's kind of where we see a more realistic angle. It, this is very specific to the, to the energy sector because every utility is, is, you know, uh, managed differently. So each, each utility territory, you have, you know, state and, and local regulations that, uh, you know, that you have to comply with. So that, that's what we're doing there. And the idea is that uh, potentially there could be a global, 
future uh, application or a globally scalable application of the technology and that the coin will be used to transact to basically to invest in renewable energy projects fractionally anywhere in the world that that Sun Fund may or may not own uh, and then receive a return on the on that investment fractionally as well. So it's sort of like a, those are the two directions. We have like a more bespoke, limited, defined, um, you know, utility facing uh, service uh, you know, proposition that we're going to be developing. And, and the thing is, is we're working with a lot of utilities. So we already we already have a dialogue and a, and a relationship with a number of the nation's largest utilities. So when you talk about the coin aspect, it's not it's part of that is the store of value acts like a currency aspect of blockchain. But then because it has something to do with things going on around the world, it sounds like there's a there's like some sort of contractual element, like a smart contract element involved with that. Yeah, the bespoke the bespoke well. sure, the bespoke blockchain technology applications will be unique coins beyond that. They will be interchangeable with the Sun Fund coin, but each 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 system will have its own currency because these are these are closed ecosystems. Yeah. Sure. Please. I think this is interesting. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, you know talk and activity regarding um, cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin mining. Our company is 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 literally starting uh, an operation in that business as well. And my question for you is, like, we're approaching it from the sustainable Bitcoin mining concept. In other words, using solar or other renewable energy resources to power the mining operations to control costs as as the difficulty goes up and more energy is required, obviously it's going to be an issue. Um, but my question for you is, is let's assume that you have all of this capacity engaged in Bitcoin mining. And let's assume that for whatever reason, we don't need to say why, that it becomes just unprofitable and all this equipment is out there. Is there Are there other applications for the equipment that's and the infrastructure that's being developed for the purposes of coin mining that could be shifted to other other data applications like data processing applications that might be profitable. Can Just you, curious to hear your thoughts because there's a lot of equipment being purchased, invested in a lot of capex going on right now. Just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, can you use, can yeah, you my, use my Bitcoin thinking. mining equipment for something like a big data uh, problem? Yes, and the answer is absolutely. Um, in general, uh, you know, your your offering is is really interesting. Um, so let's talk about your typical Bitcoin, and then I'll hit um, what I think Sun Fund's doing that that is really quite in, really I think arguably potentially more interesting. Um, so your typical Bitcoin situation is you have basically a lot of computer computing power, which is good at solving math problems. Well. In addition to Bitcoin, we have a lot of other math problems. You know, there's problems in genetics and bioengineering. I mean, genes are enormously complicated sequencing and trying to figure out what is repetitive and what is the statistical relationships. There's all kinds of problems in machine learning that take up a phenomenal amount of computing resources. Um, and if you provide the, if you actually provide those computing resources. Uh, you can solve problems like, you know, chess is sort of the classic example that as a species we've been working on, you know, pretty heavily for a century or so in terms of how good can we get. And Google in the last year uh, made really uh, substantial progress by applying a lot of the machine learning algorithms, um, you know, and, and this applies to almost all decision systems that we have on the planet um, can similarly be attacked. There's a lot of people making a lot of decisions based on partial information and with a lot more information, they can make better, much better decisions. Um, you know, what percentage of the world's decisions could be usurped this way? You know, everybody agrees it's at least five. Um, is it 20? Is it 30? Is it 40? Um, uh, wait, wait, you know, what, are, what are those numbers? Five, 20, 30, 40? What are they? You're in other words, about percentage big of the world's dis percentage of, I'm sorry, am I yawning? No, that's me breathing into the oh. mic. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Is that uh, you or me, Yanni? All <laughs> uh, right. Uh, the, the, those represent the percentage of the world's decision. So if you think about everybody who is a knowledge worker, um, you know, that's everybody from, let's say, bankers trying to decide, you know, uh, in a loan fulfillment group, whether to or, or not give a loan. Um, you know, people at the DMV deciding whether to suspend a driver's license or not. Uh, people at... Um, in a court determining whether a uh, somebody is, is or is not guilty of a crime based upon the evidence presented, et cetera. Um, all decisions that we make as a species, what percentage of those could be replaced by machine learning algorithms given today's technology? Now, Jesus, no let it replace drivers. Re like right now, let's replace all 
human drivers because the the quality of human drivers has gotten so bad that even <laughs> even veteran motorcycle riders who are completely comfortable on the road are getting off the road. They're checking out, not because their faculties are diminishing so much, but because the quality of drivers is diminishing so rapidly because of the two, three... Distracted driving. You've got right? three screens. If you've got a, uh, any kind of like LCD in your panel, and then you have your phone hooked up for the GPS thing, and then you've got your watch going off, uh, and maybe you want to... And then you've hooked up to the Bluetooth in the car... There are so many paths of information that you have to deal with just inside the glass of the car, let alone looking outside. I mean, please, let's replace drivers first. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm get off my soapbox. Well, I mean, that, that actually is an area where, where yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of progress. Um, so when you talk about percentage, of, so yes, the, the people are actually going after drivers, but percentage of the world's decisions that could be attacked by machine learning, the answer is, is um, Bitcoin could handle machine learning all of this all of this infrastructure could be reasonably easily repurposed to all kinds of other societally beneficial things of which, you know, figuring out, um, uh, you know, how to factor large prime numbers is not among them. Um, and, you know, the, the solutions to hashing problems. Um, so yes, it could all be put useful. Now where I think Sun is interesting is, is that, that which makes you guys even potentially more interesting. Sun Again, Fund. Cut this, this is too. Yeah, Sun Fund. Sorry, Sun Fund is uh, more interesting. Is you guys actually have something that's sort of unique, um, which is that you have this these solar panels, which are not necessarily located near good networking, but are no located near cheap electricity. Your typical data center, um, as they exist on the planet, are built uh, around fiber. Um, where telecommunications companies have built fiber. So they're built around, they were built for the purpose of intermixing signal. Oh, and by the way, they can do other stuff too. But they were built for the purpose primarily of intermixing signals coming from various fibers uh, and strengthening them about every 100 kilometers along, along the path of a fiber um, and where they intersect with each other. Um, so they're basically, they're based upon our networking needs. So your typical data center has good networking, moderate electricity costs, and, you know, reasonably inexpensive floor space. You guys have a very different value proposition, which is you have low electricity costs, but not necessarily very good networking. Um, that totally changes the economics of what kinds of problems you can solve. You can solve more economically efficiently any problem which is mathematical for which you don't need good networking, which is almost all of scientific computing, for example. So wait a minute. Um, so let me let me just uh, encapsulate that for a second. So they have cheap electricity because they can put solar panels basically anywhere. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying because they already have the solar panels. They're not building them for the data centers, and they're using <sighs> excess electricity. Their cost of electricity is essentially slightly above zero. Okay. Yeah, or close. I mean, the the model is kind of like we're what we're doing is we're we're creating we're we're constantly building and developing new electricity resources like solar fields or whatever, say like a five acre solar field or something. Um, and we can we can either sell that to the grid and get a subsidy and make some reasonable return, or or as you said, if you can kind of repurpose it either to coin mining, which is currently what we're very focused on, uh, and then eventually to to you know data processing. Um, we, we think it's a uh, it's it's a it's a good model in the sense that at least it's a sustainable model because of the massive energy demand. But yeah, but the idea is that we're 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 kind of we're we're flexible in the sense that we can repurpose where the electricity is is being used essentially or for what purpose, um, or not or not use it at all for the purposes of data processing if if need be. Okay, so when typically when you're buying data center space, you're paying for three things: you're pi paying for floor space, in other words, the physical amount of space your boxes use, which in both most data centers and in the Sun Fund type environment probably will be cheap. Um, you need to be paying for electricity, in other words, how much, how many watts are you using up with your computation, and you're paying for network. And in the case of most data centers, network, it, you know, the data centers are located where network is most cheap. In the case of Sun Fund's data centers. Potentially, they're located in places where the electricity is most cheap. So for people who you intend to use a lot of electricity and not a lot of network, those become extremely profitable and uh, data centers for them to use. They'll save a lot of money. Um, so 
I, yeah, I mean, I think you, I think you guys have arguably a better than average value proposition. So yes, there's, they can, Bitcoin can be repurposed, but in your particular case, it can be repurposed with an additional financial incentive that other people don't have. Um, do you guys just want to sort of like talk about other things that are going on, going on real quick? Uh, Fred, do you want to jump in with anything before you run? I, I, I think this is all really fascinating. This is all something that I knew nothing about, which is why I've been um, somewhat uncharacteristically silent. I just, I, I think it's, it's a really, really interesting topic and it's a really important topic. And it's something that most people, myself included, really know nothing about. So yeah, I, I really did want to listen to experts. I really did want to roll out the red carpet for blockchain because I know that people, because it's math, there's a sort of psychology around things that are math. Like uh, people think that because Bitcoin is a math problem that maybe they can use it to avoid taxes or uh, maybe because it's a math problem, it's too hard for them to just use. And I think I, I wanted to just roll out the red carpet for the concept so that anybody who is in any way interested in the subject matter could go could get a nice deep dive and i think we've certainly accomplished that today no part. like next next week in like predictions go i mean i'm really just focusing on sort of the the big uh two issues one is like how does north korea get resolved uh if it gets resolved and what happens in the uh in the senate races in the house of uh the congress races oh, for next excellent. year thank you so i think that's really those are my two big issues that I'm kind of working my head around. And then um, in terms of that, say, what do we in terms of that, Fred, what did you think of the Senate race that we just had in Alabama? There were two key takeaways that I had from that. Uh, one was and again, very briefly, because I've, I've got like four minutes before I've got a hard cap on my time. Um, the, the one was that people voted for uh, for the Democrat, Republicans voted for the Democrat because they were given permission to do so by other Republicans. The Democrats aren't changing anybody's mind here. Um, it's really, it's really other Republicans that are putting out, you know, this message that it's okay to vote away from Roy Moore. And I don't think that's a process. And it was still super close. I don't think that process is duplicatable in any other state because Roy Moore was such an exceptionally bad candidate and has such a long track record in Alabama of being a generally not great person uh, that, that people allowed themselves to vote away from Roy Moore. And it was still super close. The, the write-in candidates, I mean, Nick Saban got more votes than the margin of victory. And Nick Saban's the football coach for the University of Alabama. And th that success is not duplicatable in any other state. So that was one key takeaway from that, that I took from that. Uh, the other was uh, that when the Democrats actually want to mobilize um, African-American and minority voters, they can. But again, it takes an exceptionally bad candidate and it takes a tremendous amount of work. And I think by and large, you know, that again, that doesn't, that might be able to happen in other states, but I don't see it. Yeah, I, th I think Democrats tend to do worse when they run against somebody uh, rather than when they run. <laughs> doesn't <what> doesn't <laughs> everyone? <laughs> <laughs> rather than actually standing up for something and and just telling oh, people oh, what they're what voting for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, other candidates. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jeff, what are you looking at? Uh, what's on your mind? Uh, I've been thinking a lot about um, the fact that during the Trump era, we're seeing a, a, a motion towards. <sighs> alternative voting systems in a lot of cities, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Memphis, Tennessee. We're seeing it at other places in New Mexico. We're seeing it in Minneapolis. Um, and um, what are the implications of moving to alternative electoral systems as this gets more popular? This clearly seems to be an idea that um, it's been bubbling in the left uh, uh, for a while. It seems to have passed over to the right. Uh, so it's going mainstream. And now the question is, what, is it, what does it look like for the next 20 years or 30 years? And what is what is possible and doable in the United States? And what is what would be wise to do in the United States? Mm. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Scott, anything on your mind next week coming up? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're all we're all very focused on the, the Mueller chatter. But again, it's so speculative at this point. Well, but but obviously, our eyes are on it. I would like to flag my favorite story of the week, which I'm not sh I'm not sure if the onion hacked the New York Times. But uh, there was an article, I think, in yesterday's Times 
about uh, which, with video of two F-18 aircraft chasing what appears to be a UFO off the coast of, of California. And, and uh, it, it, I would strongly suggest everyone check out the video because apparently there are uh, aliens among us. Yeah, I saw that story too. It was very, it was very uncharacteristic of the times to present a story about UFOs almost without contest. I mean, that was a very rosy picture of uh, the possibility of UFOs existing, and and it it was not. Uh, I wouldn't call that article hyper skeptical at all. It sort of gave a roadmap to the possibility of UFOs, which was, I think, kind of astonishing. It, it really was. I've never seen such an article on, you know, in such a newspaper before, ever. It was, it was absurd. All right, guys. Um, uh, as for me, I'm just looking forward to getting through the, ne- the next day. I, uh, we're Obviously, I'm, I'm thinking about Robert Miller III, Bobby Three Sticks, Flaming Arrow of God, trying to remedy the situation. I hope he does. Everybody, uh, thank you very much for joining me on the McGrady Group. It's been a great podcast. Uh, Jeffrey Bolden, Frederick Baker, Scott Licamelli, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks.